Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is, Come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. This is A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grill, Zell and Heidi here to talk about the Exodus, to talk about Passover, to talk about the early life of Moses. How's it going, Zell? It's going pretty good. Got cold again, but that's just life up here. So, Did you get hit with any of the blizzards that came up north? No, it's a little further south. <laughs> For once in your life, you can say that. Yeah, exactly. The snow is south. <laughs> I, I do feel for them, though, because I've seen snow drifts like up to 18 inches or more, which is hard because this is calving season. So prayers certainly go out to all of the ranchers. Certainly. Now, in your childhood growing up as a rancher, did you ever have to go out a calving during a winter squall? Is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> do you think you could still like tie some chains to one and, and get it done if you needed to? I suppose, but it's been a few years. It's like riding a bicycle. <laughs> You know, you never know. That's true. You're a circuit rider. You never know. You might have to, might have to <laughs> every now and then. Evangelism through uh, assisting cattle. It's been warm here. Got the garden tilled today. Very windy, as it typically is. Still, you know, very mild. I think spring might actually, might actually be here. And that's been gratuitous weather posting. So, what are we talking about today? Well. It's the Exodus or the Passover. We went back and forth, really, about what to call this episode, because Exodus really encompasses much more than the Passover, and certainly the whole story of Moses is more than the Passover. But Zelwyn, why are we talking about the Passover right now? Well, this episode is, of course, releasing during Holy Week, and it's important to talk about what the Passover is in particular during Holy Week, because Christ has become our Passover lamb and in all of the events are happening around the Passover. So to talk about this and to really flesh it out will help us to understand what's going on in the Gospels as well. You know, we want to take some time to go through these Old Testament accounts and really study them for the history that they are. And of course, we will move toward their fulfillment in Christ. But to talk about the events themselves is a reminder that these are actual historical events of God's mighty hand working among his people. The Lord working in the Old Testament is significant, and it's true. And more and more, as the authenticity of the scriptures is chipped away at by various forces, we, at a word fitly spoken, want to constantly reinforce that the biblical accounts are true, and they are authentic histories of God's people. And they're not just histories that are given for the sake of, okay, and now we can move on to Jesus, too. I think sure. sometimes that's a danger we run into as well. Okay, we talked about Moses, so let's, you know, we talked about the Red Sea, let's jump right to Jesus now. No, we have to recognize that God is working a real salvation for a real people, which does have meaning beyond itself, of course, but we need to see what God is doing now during the days of the Exodus so that we can understand what that further meaning is. Absolutely. And as Christians, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are members of his covenant. Therefore, we are joined to his people of all times, his covenant people. And so, in many ways, the Exodus story is our story. It's the story of our forefathers. We ought to look at it that way. It's, it's, it's real history. It's their history. But through Jesus Christ, it's actually our history as well. Their God is your God. The God who brought your forefathers out of the land of Egypt 
has brought you into his heavenly kingdom and made you sons of Abraham, even the forerunner of Moses. We do well to study the history of our fathers. And maybe that's a bit foreign. You know, we were fine, you know, studying the fathers, you know, say at the Council of Ephesus, right? But what about our our fathers, you know, in the scriptures? So here we are. Also, Zelwyn has been chomping at the bit to talk about Egypt. And so we're we're gonna we're gonna, you know, dip and our foot in the water yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, hang tight, relax with us here. We're gonna be wading through the scriptures and then we'll get to um, the ultimate fulfillment before the end of the hour. So so the first things first, the major players, other than the Lord God, of course, first one's going to be Moses. Now, who is Moses? Moses is a Levite, and God raises him up specifically for the task of bringing his people out of Egypt. The famous account of Moses avoiding the edict of Pharaoh to be killed because he's an Israelite boy by going in the basket down the river Nile and being found and raised in Pharaoh's house and all that. But God uses Moses as a way to bring his people out. You know, we have to remark a little bit on the uniqueness of Moses' situation by virtue of being adopted in the house of Pharaoh. Sure. Reaches adulthood, still has high stature, (laughs) you know, to say the least. But he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and then straight up kills the guy, the Egyptian, right. who's doing it. Pharaoh's punishment for that is, of course, death. And so then that causes Moses to flee the house of Pharaoh to Midian, right. which is some desert south of Judah, meets Jethro, marries Jethro's daughter, becomes a shepherd, living that bucolic life, I guess we'll say, <laughs> until God interrupts those plans. He God then, through the burning bush, which you heard part of in the intro, calls Moses out to be the liberator of his people. It might have been the most succinct retelling of that story ever. So, Well, well done. Well done. <laughs> Making reference to Stephen's sermon or speech, whatever you want to call it, in Acts 7, we don't want to think of the murder of Moses being a murderer just because he's somehow terrible. Stephen actually tells us that in chapter 7, verse 25 of Acts, that he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. So sure. Moses, even from the beginning of his mission, like, you know, the 40 years before he actually comes back to Egypt, is beginning to be the one who delivers Israel from the Egyptians. This is God bringing his justice to his people. So there's just the setup for Moses and his initial calling. Now, it's more than just getting through the plagues and getting through the Red Sea. There's the, there's the entire story of, of the Exodus. But in these initial parts here, Moses' opponent is going to be Pharaoh, and we're actually dealing with two Pharaohs in this account, right? Correct. The Pharaoh who tried to have him killed, is it said that he dies in Exodus chapter 2, and a second Pharaoh arises after him and is actually what we might call the, the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Before we try to identify which pharaoh, what is a pharaoh? This is maybe where the indulging me might get me into trouble, but (laughs) the word pharaoh is a biblical word used to describe the king of Egypt. And the king of Egypt sees himself as a at least semi-divine kind of character, one who the whole world depends on, the linchpin of creation, so to speak. Without him and without him being Pharaoh, they, the Egyptians believe that the world could not continue. So he, he definitely has a, a very proud kind of outlook on life. I mean, you would if you consider yourself to be a god. And he is the one who God is, that God is going against over and over again in the plagues. We have something of a demigod, or at least a divine being. Okay, right. He has enslaved the Hebrews. Now... Can you briefly explain the relationship between the Hebrews and the Egyptians? It has deteriorated here to the point that the Hebrews are now slaves of Pharaoh. Was it always that way? Well, no. In the days of Joseph, for example, at the end of Genesis, Joseph is is the the vizier, the, the second in command of Egypt, you know, second only to Pharaoh. So Israel enjoyed a very high position in those days. But that's been several hundred years ago. 
in the meantime, because for various reasons, not least of which would be the, the peoples moving in and out and the souring of relations in Egypt between the foreigners and Egypt, Israel has become enslaved to Egypt. And they are serving to make bricks for them as forced labor. Right. I should mention, because we almost always see this in the movies and stuff, that the Jews did not build the pyramids. The pyramids have been around for hundreds of years by this point. I just want to clarify that little tidbit. Correct. It was the aliens that built <laughs> the pyramids. Yeah, exactly. Really... Right. <laughs> the forgetting of Joseph is significant and a really rather poignant part of scripture, but it is part of, this is what false religion does, right? Any any bit of God's favor, idolatry tends to harden you against, against that truth. And so right. the rejecting of the faithful people is, is actually evidence of that idolatry taking root. I mean, not that the Egyptians were ever believers by any means, and that's not what I intend to say, but that forgetting Joseph, forgetting what they knew, forgetting some semblance of doing the right thing, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill there. No, I, I think you're on to something because the, the Pharaoh at that time, and again, this had been quite a bit, quite a while ago, says, you know, is there is there any other man in whom is the wisdom of, of God, right? So I think Pharaoh, in his own way, recognizes the Lord in Joseph. And I'm not saying that makes him a true God-fearer or that, you know, that he died a believer or something like that. I'm just saying that, yeah, there is something that God gave him, that, however much that was, that has now been rejected. Partly because of his own pride, partly because he believes himself to be a god, that's going to harden anybody's heart. Absolutely. One other point, uh, since you mentioned them not building the pyramids, we have a saying that passed into English because of this, called, and it's like, we're going to have to make bricks without straw. Right. But the point is, you, you have to have straw. And, and so they still had to get it. And so you right. can't use that as an excuse to do things the wrong way or to make people do something ridiculous, you know, or impossible, because that makes you Pharaoh. Right. And I heard right. it time and time again, you know, well, we don't have enough money to pay our workers. Guess you guys are just going to have to learn to make bricks without straw. Not how it works, guy. We need to get rid of that. <laughs> anyway, before I go all workers of the world here, uh, <laughs> we just <laughs> just remember, you still have, they still had to go get some straw. So anyway, so now we've moved up. Before we go into too much more to further into this, who do you think are the two pharaohs that we're going to deal with in these accounts? Honestly, and this is a little bit of a question of debate because it all depends on when you think the Exodus actually happened. I tend to side with a theory that says that it happened at a relatively early date in terms of time. But Egyptian chronology is also a little bit sketchy because it's a little bit of guesswork. But the pharaoh that I think we would consider to be the pharaoh of the Exodus would have to be the one that we call Tutmos III, a pharaoh who lives, oh, I'm trying to remember the dates here. Let me pull them up. Roughly between the years 1479 and 1425 BC. Okay. The reason why I think he is the, the pharaoh of the Exodus is because, one, he would roughly fit the, the early timeline. Two, he was a well-known pharaoh, very notable for his achievements. So he would have been a, a strong figure. And three, there was a lot of things going on in his own personal history that would have made him even more susceptible to being hardened in his heart. Because the pharaoh who comes before him is, well, his father, Tutmos II, but he also in, deals with a very interesting figure in history called Hatshepsut, who is noted for being one of the only female pharaohs. And the fact that she had to take that kind of, that she attempted to take that role upon herself over Tutmos III kind of, I think, led to some personal tensions and maybe some personal feelings and animosities, especially because afterwards he did some things that kind of tried to erase her memory a little bit. So he's kind of dealing with these personal problems, and he's really trying to emphasize the legitimacy of his rule, all of which would contribute to him not wanting to give in to some punk Hebrew coming and telling him to take away all the slaves. See, I believe it's Ramsey's because Yul Brynner played him so convincingly. <laughs> That's where I It's a good movie. It's a good movie. 
Ramesses the second would be the late theory, the idea that the that the Exodus happened at least a couple hundred years further down in history, around the twelve hundred BCs. And I think to be fair to the movie, the the fifty seven movie, that was probably the prevailing theory at that time. Well, a lot of people do think that the the early theory is actually kind of the minority one, partly because for one thing, the the cities of Python and Ramesses they really come into prominence during that time. And so if you want to make reference to those cities, as the Bible does, some people say, well, then it has to be the later date. I think that it could just have been an updated name of a town that already existed. But again, that's getting kind of way out into the reeds here. So before we go to break, we have a few minutes. Let's then contrast or begin to contrast Hebrew religion with the Egyptian religion. Let's start with the Hebrew one because that's going to be much simpler for us. The Hebrew religion, of course, would just be the the fear of of the Lord, right? The to serve God. I mean, Moses comes as his servant to speak as his messenger, not as a semi divine kind of character, not as like taking things up upon himself, but sent by the Lord to deliver his people because ultimately it is God who is doing the exodus. He identifies himself explicitly as the true and only God, the same God that we believe. He is not one God among many gods, but he is the true God. They are monotheists in the in the true sense. On paper, it gets a little tricky, golden calf and stuff later on. Technically just one calf, I guess, but <laughs> well, true, but but their their time in Egypt does deeply affect them. I mean, I think that they are kind of infected with the idolatry of Egypt, but that's neither here nor there. You know, so then let's begin to talk about Egyptian religion. Fundamentally, they are polytheists, right? Right. And of course, this is where I'm going to dig myself into a, a really, really long hole here. They are polytheists in that they believe in many gods, but a lot of their gods, of course, were were more local gods. So like, just because we look at the the gods of Egypt doesn't mean that every city worshipped all of these gods or that even every Egyptian would have known all of these gods. It just means that they worshipped many gods in many different places, some of whom were known throughout the kingdom and stuff like that. But the one key figure in all of it is Pharaoh himself, because he is considered to be the chief priest of all the temples, he's considered to be the, like I say, the linchpin between the, the the divine realm and between the the mortal realm, and the one who keeps it all together. So, if you really want to boil Egyptian religion down to something that they all held in common, it would be Pharaoh. Very good. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more word fitly spoken. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The Word, front and center, in doctrine, in history, in life. That's the mission of A Word Fitly Spoken. We've got more on the way. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We are back. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grills, Zell and Heidi, talking about Moses, Pharaoh, the Exodus, and more. So, we left talking about Pharaoh as a divine figure. Talked a little bit about Hebrew religion, Egyptian religion. So now let's get into the story. Moses has been called and commissioned by God to liberate his people. Moses, in the name of the one true God goes to Pharaoh, says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. Why is Pharaoh reluctant to obey God's command? Other than the fact that his heart is heartened by sin. But what specifically might cause a Pharaoh to reject this? 
Honestly, I think it has to do with his self-conception of being at least quasi-divine. Because he believes himself to be a god, and because of, well, I mean, if, if Tutmos is the, the pharaoh of the Exodus, all of his personal hang-ups as well, because he believes himself to be a god, he's not going to listen to a, another god who is going to tell him to do something totally contrary to what he is doing. It's basically saying, like, Pharaoh, you need to listen to me. And Pharaoh doesn't want to do that. And I, I forgot to mention this in the previous section, but I think this will maybe help you to understand a little bit about his own self-conception. Every Pharaoh, except the very earliest ones, had a number of titles. Tutmos III's titles went like this. Horus, Mighty Bull, Arising in Thebes, he of the two ladies, enduring in kingship like Ra in heaven. Horus of gold, powerful of strength, sacred of appearance. He of the sedge in the bee, which just meant that he was king of, of upper and lower Egypt. Enduring of form is Ra, son of Ra, Tutmos, beautiful of forms. And Tutmos, uh, the name itself means Thoth is born. Well, for all you expecting mothers out there, there's some names for you. A whole pile. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but you can hear in his titles, in his official titles and names, this idea that he believes himself to be the incarnate form of all of these different gods, that he's literally Horus on earth, so to speak. And so for God, to the true God, to come and to tell him, you need to let my people go, you need to submit yourself and humble yourself before me, Pharaoh's going to say, you know, who is this God and why should I listen to him? And so it doesn't immediately break into plagues. You have some other religious events that happen. Dealing with the Egyptian priest, do you want to give us a quick rundown of what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, quick. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the Egyptian sorcerers, as it's often translated, are actually priests, and specifically uh, what are called the lecture priests of Egypt. Lecture priests were basically priests who read written spells, written magic, and performed a various number of religious tasks as a result. The Egyptians believed that writing had a magical quality to it, which is why they wrote it everywhere on their walls, because they believed that if they wrote it, that kind of gave it a an internal permanent significance. Like you didn't have to continuously sit there and read it because it was written. The priests, the lecture priests, these magicians are the ones who take care of that. And so through their sorcery, through their dark arts, they are able to mimic some of the signs that God does. And that's not to be confused with the Lord God, you know, commanding the Israelites to write the word on their foreheads and on their doorposts or anything like that. Yeah, because what God is saying when we write the word on our doorposts or write the word on our foreheads, or whatever, he's telling us to call it to mind, to always have it before us to remember it. Right. This would be like if we wrote it on the door because we figured by writing it, that would ward off vampires or something. Right. You know? And yeah, I mean, and you do get that idolatrous approach to writing that develops in Jewish magic later on with the Kabbalistic heretics and things like right. that. Right. That approach to language is witchery, you know, regardless of who you would claim to have allegiance to, you have now fallen into gross idolatry when you when you commit that kind of or when you commit to that kind of idea. So what are what are they able to do then through this magic? And I think because they are permitted to mimic these signs, I would actually liken this to the witch of Endor in the later years with Saul, so in 2 Samuel, who was able to conjure up the spirit of Samuel not because she has some sort of innate power but because she is suddenly permitted to do it. God permits these magicians to mimic some of the signs in order to actually further harden Pharaoh in his in yeah. his heart. So what kind of, what's an example? What what happens here? And the first sign that they're able to imitate of course is the the staff turning into a snake. Moses casts down his staff, it turns into a serpent. The magicians do the lecture priests do the same, but the the staff of Moses eats the sta the staves of the priests. Then of course you have the the first of the three of the the first three plagues which they do which, of course, is turning the Nile into blood, frogs, and the gnats. Right. 
And with the, the coming of the gnats, the magicians realize that they can't, that this is actually God at work. You know, this is the finger of God. So to a point, they're able to basically make false miracles, false signs. We're told in Revelation that the second beast is able to do, you know, Satan is able to do false miracles as well. Right. Now, one interesting question here then, are they just illusions or is there actually something magical happening here? I don't think they're illusions. I think that this was a legitimate thing that they were doing because we in the modern West tend to dismiss magic as purely illusionary. But I don't think we should do that because that leads us into the it also into a trap of, you know, being caught up in our own big brainness. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because we think it's impossible. So we, you know, we'd never be taken in by anything like that. Well, then if it does happen, it might actually do that. The fact that it is real is dangerous. It's all borne out by God's constant commandments against it. Right. God isn't saying avoid cup and ball, you know, magic kit at your local shop, although maybe, but the, <laughs> but the point is it's, it's not just mere sleight of hand, uh, you right. know, probably, probably the greatest sin in sleight of hand is, is either is deception for the sake of theft, but there's a real spiritual deception that happens in true witchcraft, true demonic arts. And the scriptures don't seem to treat them lightly or they wouldn't treat them so heavily or so gravely if there wasn't real danger here, if there wasn't some legitimacy right. to them. Right. And so we avoid those kinds of things. So you mentioned they're able to sort of fake the plagues to a point. Let's kind of go into that a little bit. Let's go into the plagues as much as we can here. So Moses is going to go to Pharaoh more than once, telling mm -hmm. him the command of the Lord to let my people go. Pharaoh's again and again going to say no, he's not going to relent. So then the signs intensify and we have the plagues. So what do we want mm -hmm. to say about the plagues of Egypt? There's 10. So I mean, that's the most basic point. There's actually three sets of three followed by the 10th. So you have three cycles of three plagues that eventually that kind of circle in until we finally get to the 10th plague, which of course is the Passover itself. And the reason why I bring that out is because if you if you read the plagues all together, you'll notice that there's actually a pattern. The first plague in a cycle always begins with God telling Moses to go to Pharaoh in the morning and to while he's going out to the water and tell him this. The second plague in a cycle always tells the Lord tells Moses to go into Pharaoh and to tell him something, you know, somewhere else. And then the third plague, he just tells him to do it. He doesn't actually ever talk to Pharaoh. So you see that cycle th repeated three times. But as the cycle itself is going, the number of people it's affecting actually gets smaller and smaller. Because the first three plagues affect all of Egypt and actually affect Israel too. I, I think that's something that, that's interesting. Because you have in the fourth plague, the beginning of the second cycle, God saying, well, I'm going to set apart Goshen. I'm going to set apart my people and they will not be affected, but Egypt still will. So the first one affects everybody. The second one affects just Egypt without Israel. And then the beginning of the third cycle with the seventh plague, it actually is says in uh, chapter 9, verse 14, for this time, I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. So let's really briefly go through the plagues. They don't okay. have a purely naturalistic explanation. We're going to reject that out of hand, although one could naturally lead to the other in a few cases. But sure. again, that doesn't, doesn't really explain a river of blood by any means, or hail of fire, or, or I guess it's technically hail and fire. So it's fire from the skies and hail, which is something you shouldn't see together. <laughs> a, little, a little disturbing. Okay. So the first one, contrary to a certain notable publication, it's not red algae, but rather it is blood, which is a striking image, but it also causes all the life in the water to die. Right. And causes the water to no longer be potable. Well, and remember, because the Nile itself is the center of Egypt. Right. I know Pharaoh is kind of the, the social center, but they all rely on the Nile for everything. 
if the Nile doesn't flood like it's supposed to, the crops would fail, the society would collapse. So they, they do look to the river as the source of their life. Right. So the rivers turn to blood. We agree. Do you mm-hmm. think it's blood? It is. Right. Yes. Why do you think that? I mean, it'd just be that, that very idea. The, the very thing that's supposed to bring life has now actually become death. Right. I was just going to, I was just going to go with the text says blood, but yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm giving it an explanation, but yeah, it literally just says it turned to blood. I mean, there's, there's no other, we don't have to, to explain it away. Right. It just, says. it's just a shame that, you know, we're almost in some circles become embarrassed by these plain texts here, you know, not throwing shade or anything, but. Let's just let the let's let the let's let God be God. Let's let God be true, though every man a liar. And let and let the Bible be the Bible. Yeah. Right. The next is going to be frogs. So the not. Yep. So now out of a bloody river comes a bunch of frogs. And now we're going to say that this takes place over all the plagues are going to take place over a larger period of time. It's not like a really bad week or anything. This is something that's right. going to rather slowly unfold. We're not going to say years, but months. At least, yeah, maybe maybe a couple months, maybe at least a few months. Right. If only because just in various parts of the text, like the Nile, for example, is blood for a week. So it's not like this is happening, you know, bam, 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 bam. It is something that does take a little bit of time. Yeah, and, and you get the idea that it's unfolding a little more gradually because God is is truly giving Pharaoh time to repent or sure. to relent. Even though he's eventually going to harden his heart, or or really, I mean, it's purpose from the beginning, but... It's a sincere offer here. Like th- this is not just an illustration. This is simply like you—you you did have a true opportunity. Egypt has an opportunity to repent that other nations will not later in the Old Testament. Right. So their their judgment may actually be greater. We don't know. I mean, it's gonna not be good to be Canaan, but Egypt had a greater measure here of knowledge. So, all right. So we have the right. frogs. The next is going to be lice. You want to say or gnats or gnats or, or nits I mean, <laughs> or no seams or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So we're not quite sure. It's tiny insects, tiny swarming insects of some kind. Exactly. Which we normally call gnats. So, right. Which come upon men and animals. And then right. what's this fourth plague here? The flies or the swarms? Yes, the swarms. Another one that, again, because of the word used is not used very often in the Old Testament. Especially when it comes to like plants and animals and and rocks in the Old Testament, sometimes we have to just give our best possible interpretation. This would be another one. Forms of some kind come upon the land. So you got that. And we missed something here. You know, we've got, so the first cycle ends with three, and then we come upon, we're in the next cycle here, and the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart and and Pharaoh refuses to keep his promise. Mm-hmm. We have a whole episode dedicated to this, so if you want a larger discussion on the hardening of Pharaoh, we'll link to that episode in the description when we talk about that tension between Pharaoh hardening his own and God hardening his, so we won't delve into it too much this episode. In a couple sentences, why is Pharaoh being hardened? So that God might show forth his mercy upon his people and might deliver his people and make his glory shown. Right, right. Yeah, and you also have, at this point... Kind of in this area, this this debate between Pharaoh and Moses. Pharaoh entertains the idea, maybe I'll let you go, but only some of you can go. And Moses says, no, we all got to go. And and kind of this will go back and forth where Pharaoh will say, okay, maybe a little bit more of you can go. And Moses is like, no, we all have to go. And and finally, when Pharaoh lets them go after the 10th plague, then they can all go. So, I mean, you kind of get that progressive hardening that way too. Anyway. So, right. The fifth plague. <laughs> A uh, pestilence upon the livestock. Next comes boils. And that's the one where God says to Moses and Aaron to take soot from the furnace and toss it in the air. Right. And it becomes a dust over the whole land of Egypt. And that's what causes the boils to break out. Right. That's an interesting one and kind of throws out any notion of a naturalistic explanation. Well, you had that with the, the gnats in the third place. That's true. Too. Yeah, it happens. Well, yeah, that's right. The dust throughout the land again. In three, in the third plague, he hits it with the rod, and with the boils, they throw it into the air. Right. Still, it's still, well, no, it's actually, it's dust in three and soot in six. But the, the point is, is, is what you were pointing out, this is not something that we should say, oh, well, you know, soot is actually going to cause boils. God causes this to be what causes Correct. it. Correct. 
And God's going to do this in gift language, too, when it comes to, say, water from a rock and things like that. So it's not just limited to plagues, but... God is not limited in his power. Like, he uses his ordinary providence to give us the things of, of our life, but God can do what he wants. I mean, right. that's really the point here. And, and two, also, he's still working through those that he's called. So he's involving them in that. Okay, so we've come to the next cycle, right? Are we in the... Right, the third cycle, yeah, with the, the seventh plague. Yeah, so we've got hail and fire. The next is going to be locusts, which are which are mm-hmm. consuming the Egyptian country, your houses, and those of your officials, speaking mm-hmm. to Pharaoh. Then we have three days of darkness. So Moses stretches his hand towards the sky, and that causes darkness to fall. And that ends the third cycle. And then we come to the most significant plague and, and the one that, that the Passover actually comes from. So what right. happens there, Zelda? The angel of the Lord is sent to destroy the firstborn of Egypt. And the Passover, of course, being putting of the, the blood of the lamb over the doorpost so that when the angel sees it, he will pass over that house and go on and carry out his destruction. Firstborn of cattle as well, in addition to human. Yep, true. So yeah, so they have to put the blood over their doorposts or otherwise they will be taken. Now it's lamb's right. blood. So we're getting a little rich in symbolism here. If you want your typology, right. here it is. You know, <laughs> lamb's blood put over you, which saves you from death and destruction. What could that be pointing toward? Huh, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> something going on this week. Right, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, a clear pointing toward Jesus, but also an actual promise to these people that if you put literal lamb's blood over the door, this plague will not touch you. Well, that's that's really kind of the thing we should emphasize here, too, is that, yes, this points to Jesus, and we absolutely affirm that. But these, this is a real Passover in a real Egypt with real lamb's blood in a real time. Right. God delivered his people at this moment. Yeah, and he's getting ready to deliver them further. In, in the next miracle, but it's interesting here, a couple things. The Lord says, about midnight, I will go through Egypt, and every firstborn son will die. So right. the Lord is going through and executing this judgment. He is taking responsibility himself. I will go throughout Egypt. I mean, this is the Lord's judgment here. Right. And, I, I, you know, that's very stark, but that is the, the language there. He, he takes the credit. Now, what's going to be Pharaoh's reaction to this plague? Pharaoh will actually finally relent enough to at least let Israel go. Of course, he is going to be hardened again when he pursues them to the Red Sea. But at this point, he's willing to say, okay, fine, I I give up, go. And it's, I mean, it's a little strong, right? I mean, he orders them to leave. They can take whatever they want. Right. Just get out. You know, Pharaoh sees what's happening and is at least sensible enough to relent. Do we want to say anything more about the plagues before we had to break? All I was emphasizing, and I think what we need to emphasize over and over again, because I, I think we might say, sure, this is historical. Yes, we believe it's real. We believe it's real history. The reason why we're emphasizing it in this way is because I think we do have a tendency to run so fast to the New Testament. Not that that's like that Jesus isn't the author or perfecter of our faith. I mean, he is, and he is the the means by which we are saved. But if we only are looking at the account of the Exodus in such a way that we just immediately run to Jesus and not really talk about what God is doing right here and right now, why does it need to be historical? Right? Sure. I mean, and then maybe that's going to, and that might sound a little stark, a little kind of uh, harsh, but if all this is is just a pointer or even just an example for us, then it doesn't have to be historical. But God is actually carrying out his purposes here in Egypt so that his people can go to the promised land so that Jesus will come. We don't want to look past this. We have to look through it, so to speak. Amen. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken.
The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. The Word of God is the center of our faith life. Join us every Thursday for a new podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcasting app. Follow us on Twitter at WordFitly. Check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash WordFitly. And check out our website, wordfitlyspoken.org. We thank you for listening and stay tuned for more Word Fitly Spoken. We are back. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken, Willie Grill, Zell and Heidi talking hard-hearted Pharaoh and the Hebrews. The plagues have happened. The final one has taken the firstborn. Pharaoh relents. The Egyptians are told to leave. Take whatever you want. Just get out. They do. They come to the Red Sea. What happens? God uses Moses to divide the Red Sea. Now stretch out your hands. The sea parts and... Is it like muddy there? Is there still some puddles? Yeah, no, no. The Bible says they passed on dry ground. You know, there's there's some of these there's these kind of lame theories like, well, it's the Reed Sea and the Reed Sea shallow, or it's the north part of the Red Sea which is shallow. So at that time of the, the wind blew it and they could walk over it. I mean, it's any explanation but the biblical one seems to satisfy skeptics, right? Yeah. Well. It, I doubt it because a skeptic would doubt even that. So right, we'll give give them enough time; they'll doubt anything. Well, yeah. So don't don't try and to make yourself sound like you know. Oh, this is something the world can believe because let's face it, the world will never believe. Just right. accept the Bible. The Hebrews are permitted to pass, and they do. Pharaoh's heart is hardened further. He decides to pursue them for what purpose? To kill them and bring them back into slavery. Well, the ones who he doesn't kill. Uh, right, right. <laughs> so the Israelites are able to pass. Well, the, the Hebrews are able to pass. God commands Moses to stretch out his arms again so that the sea might be closed. Pharaoh's host, that is to say Pharaoh's army and equipment, drives into the sea. The sea closes in around them, killing them. Is that a accurate rundown of the events, it is. I believe? Yep, yes, it is. A lot to unpack here. There's New Testament imagery going on. But this is that sort of ultimate sign in the midst of this saga of Israel's redemption, because now they've gotten through the most treacherous part. You know, how can they get past a sea? And they do. God parts the water so that they may, and he also vanquishes their enemies. Now, that's significant. You know, an Egyptian army being destroyed, Pharaoh giving pursuit, all of these signs have happened. But we don't have a tremendous amount of archaeological evidence. Should that trouble us, say that there's no account on a sarcophagus wall somewhere, or uh, t- excuse me, the wall of a tomb somewhere depicting these events? Should that trouble us? No, I don't think it really should. And I have, a, I have several reasons why I say that. First of all, you have to realize something about the Egyptian mind. If you remember earlier when I was talking about writing, and they kind of believed it had that eternal quality to it, that kind of magical quality to it. They believed that if you wrote it down, it would be always there. And because of that, they never recorded anything that put things into a bad light, because that would be like enshrining a disaster that would always be there upon Egypt. So you never really wrote down bad things. Or if you did, you always wrote down the things that that you wrote it down in such a way that it showed that you were taking care of the problem, right? I was the one who gave food to all of these people who were starving. I was the one who, you know, took care of the widow. I was the one who took care of the orphan. It's always kind of this self-promoting, self-building up kind of approach to writing. And I think that would be the biggest reason why there is no written record in Egypt of these things happening, because it was a disaster from e- for Egypt from beginning to end. There's, I mean, there's no good way to spin this, right? <laughs> sure. And the other reason, kind of the more minor reason, is because a lot of the monuments that we have from Egypt throughout history were were plundered and take, and the stones themselves were taken 
and used for other things, either to build other buildings or in some cases, like the limestone of the pyramids, was ground down and used for other purposes. So maybe there was something written, but it was destroyed. I mean, that's possible because we haven't been able to read the Egyptian language except for the past couple hundred years. You'll kind of see, you know, some memes and stuff floating around about chariots found at the bottom of the sea or something Mm -hmm. like that. Are those spurious accounts? You know, and I think really the point that we should make here is that we want to look for things like this, like we found chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea, or we found the Ark of Noah, or we find all of these things other than the Bible, because we think that it's somehow going to give that proof to God's word that we think that the word doesn't already have. I don't think we should put our trust into these things, because even if it was true that there you know, are chariots at the bottom, and maybe there are, I don't know, that doesn't change the fact that God cannot lie, right? Let's trust the word. <laughs> yeah, he, the word is what he has preserved for the building up of our faith. Right. He doesn't raise up Indiana Jones for that. <laughs> and... <laughs> That would be pretty cool, though. But it, it would be, but sadly, he didn't. Yeah, we don't. We don't need Indiana Jones finding the lost ark because we have we have the Word, we have Jesus, and even if it did find the ark, it wouldn't change anything, right? And so the Israelites have been delivered. Pharaoh is vanquished, defeated. That's kind of as far as we're going to go into the Exodus story here because. It's a high note, and it goes downhill really fast from here, you know, <laughs> like idolatry and grumbling immediately, and then right. you know, forty years of wandering in the wilderness. It, it is interesting that they are delivered from all of this. They the the Hebrews that is, and some Egyptians are saved. I want to point that out too. That right in the deliverance, some Egyptians go, and some Egyptians are saved. Already there, it's it's beyond a, a purely tribal thing that that there are Gentiles brought in. To the covenant really early on. Well, and if, if you remember too, Ephraim and Manasseh are the sons of an Egyptian woman. Yep, that's true. So, I mean, there's there's kind of Egyptian blood mixed in already. Right, so right. it's not just a purely tribal thing. Right. Now, very quickly, they begin to grumble. Moses is up on the mountain with elders receiving the word of the Lord, and they fall into idolatry, and they want to go back to the what they falsely remember as a better life in Egypt. And it probably is an easier life than what they're going through at that point. And yet it's even in the face of these great miracles, they're going to have a visible manifestation of God mm-hmm. that guides them. They're going to have miraculous food, and they're still going to grumble and to fall into idolatry. So for the pastors out there <laughs> who sometimes <laughs> despair, or or even parents who sometimes despair at the behavior of their children, well, how do you think the Lord God felt? Um, how much worse is the response of the Hebrews to the graciousness of our sovereign Lord here? There's nothing new under the sun indeed. But we won't go into that. Well, we might save that for, that might be a, a good later episode because that second half of Exodus, or of the saga anyway, doesn't get near as much press as, as this as this part. Why does Moses matter? Why does the story of Moses matter today? Well, it has to matter because, as we've tried to emphasize throughout this whole thing, this is God working a real deliverance for his people. Moses is not a boogeyman that, you know, brings us the law law, or something like that. (laughs) Moses is not just a mythical figure that kind of explains things. Moses is a real man who God used to bring out a real people. And we can apply that, of course, to our own real man, Jesus Christ, leading us out and into the kingdom of God, into his promised land through the shedding of his blood. Yes. But the parallels between the two really drive home the point of what Jesus has come to do. And so it's not just merely for the sake of telling a story, but we see that God not only saved Israel at that time, but he's also saving us through the deliverance of our Passover lamb. The Passover is going to be celebrated here. You know, if you're listening to this during Holy Week, if you're listening to it later, you know, again, that's the time that we're recording this, dropping this episode anyway. The Passover is the commemoration of this, at least in the Old Testament festival system. But that Passover is ultimately fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we want to do a couple things here, and this is really in the face of modern worship. 
all of our Passover celebrations as Christians ought to be celebrations of Christ. And that means celebrating them according to his institution. So we do, as far as ceremony goes, put away the old things. That means that when the Israelites are commanded to remember this Passover in a specific way, you know, in a ritual way, we no longer do that. How do we celebrate the Passover, Zelwyn? Well, we celebrate the Passover by reflecting on our own Passover lamb, right? To to hear the forgiveness that has been won at Calvary, to receive the gifts that he, he comes to give us, and to believe. We are celebrating every day, truly, but, you know, corporately, in the divine service, our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, and receiving the benefits, I mean, it, truly receiving the blood of that lamb in the Lord's Supper. Right. Right. That is how a Christian celebrates Passover. I find it interesting today, this is only really on my mind because tis the season, I'm seeing a lot of celebration of satyrs right. within Christian churches, which I think is a practice that isn't the best. I think we need to be careful about adopting these ceremonies for a number of reasons. Zellin, I don't know where you fall on this, and I don't know that if, if, if I even mentioned it in preliminary discussions for this episode or not, but... Where do you fall on the modern Passover Seder? The idea of a Seder, of course, is a post-New Testament thing. Yeah, and this, the Seder is is a Jewish dinner, <laughs> ritual dinner, commemorating right. the Passover. The right. form of it, as Zelwyn said, is post-New Testament. So when you're celebrating one of these modern Passovers, you're not recreating the Last Supper. You're not doing right. what Jesus did at the Last Supper when he when he came to celebrate the Passover. We don't know exactly what that ritual looked like. Right. So you're looking at a medieval ritual at best, and really it gets really recent when you look at the actual full on order of service, for lack of a better term. And I guess the the thing that is kind of troubling about it too is I think many churches try to implement it not out of any sort of, I mean, we have, I mean, obviously it's not commanded for one thing and it doesn't actually, I mean, the only thing I think it really adds is a kind of either cultural experience or maybe just kind of a sentimental experience. Yeah, it's definitely a novel experience and I'm trying to, I mean that in kind of a neutral way. It's trying to reach back to something historical, but it isn't. It's sort of feigning, you know, this kind of thing. It's it's a bit of appropriation. But it's not like you're appropriating something that's actually biblical. You're you're appropriating something that's extra biblical. Extra as in outside of the, I don't mean like extra, like super biblical, but <laughs> yeah, that, that's not what it is. But if you really want to celebrate Passover, quote unquote, and hear me out, the way that God commands us now to celebrate it, we look not to the Seder. We don't look to, you know, Jewish post New Testament inventions. We look to Monday, Thursday. Oh, man. We look to Good Friday. You know, if you if you want to celebrate the Passover today, receive the Lord's body and blood, our Passover lamb. Don't go back to an imitation, an appeal imitation of what's already been fulfilled. You have the greater reality. You have what the Passover pointed to. You have the Christ. The Savior has come. And so you don't have to wait till Holy Week to where you can recreate, you know, kind of borrow this ritual from someone else and claim to be celebrating the Passover. Week after week, you can do that in the true way, in the way that God prescribes, by receiving your Passover lamb, by receiving that lamb slain for everyone, that lamb whose blood has been poured over you, that has protected you, that has... The reason you live is because the blood of your lamb was shed. And not just your lamb, but the lamb of the whole world the true Passover lamb. In the Old Testament too, I mean, you already see this idea in the prophets when, you know, God says that, you know, no longer will you say as God lives who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, but, you know, as the God lives who has brought us back, so also the greater reality has come. We don't need to borrow something in order to come to the fullness of the revelation. Right. We look to where it is in Jesus. Yeah, and you don't have to strive for some perceived authenticity. To worship Jesus in true faith is an authentic celebration of the Passover, observation of the Passover. So right. you don't have to kind of play act this. You don't have to throw on a prayer shawl and do like a community theater version of Fiddler on the Roof. 
<laughs> but I want to be Tavia. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and we're not saying this to put you down if, if you're celebrating that or whatever. We're simply trying to show you a better way. We're trying to show you what God would have you receive, what God would have you believe, right. what God would have you hold on to. Because for most churches, this sort of becomes just kind of a thing you do once a year. And then if it goes on long enough, it becomes a tradition or becomes sentimental or whatever. There are people, though, that this is a gateway towards some kind of Hebrew roots movement or or some kind of Messianic Judaism, which actually, you know, I don't, I don't use this term willy-nilly here, but it actually does blend law and gospel. It's a Judaizing kind of movement that says that a true Christian is keeping the ceremonial law to some degree, that that's part of what it means to be part of the new covenant. And right. we don't want anyone to fall into that kind of error. Paul writes right. a whole letter about this. And so we want to always focus upon what God has commanded, namely, now, post-crucifixion, resurrection, post-Easter, it's worshiping Jesus where he is found, and he is found in the revealed word of God and his sacraments. And in nowhere else do you receive faith and forgiveness, but in those things. Maybe there's kind of a parallel between our other emphasis too, about this being real, you know, Exodus being a real history and not trying to go too quickly to, to something else. We don't want to just treat the Exodus as a kind of nice experience or a nice story or a nice kind of, we needed an old Testament lesson for good Friday or something. And so that's why we read Exodus. This is something that God has actually done so that we can look forward to what he has also done for us. It's right. not a, a show uh, like the a Seder might be. This is a real thing. And again, when we're talking about the Seder, that we are not denigrating the observance of the Passover that God commanded in the Old Covenant. But, and we're, but we're also not saying that the Passover Seder is the same thing. Yeah, it's a very it's different not. thing. Yeah. So don't let's not get that confused or anything. But the time for observing that has passed. It has been fulfilled. And we don't want to add any extra burdens upon people. That's kind of a extra Lutheran note as we come towards the end of this section. <laughs> so, okay, so Moses matters, worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And then again, maybe the final really comforting aspect is our mighty God who has and will deliver us. You know that God will bring you to the promised land, that God will bring you to salvation. Why? Because he's saved his people time and time again in the face of great struggle. The deliverance out of Egypt is a true deliverance. They are brought out of Egypt. They are eventually brought into the promised land. They are given what God promised them. Now, do they lose it? Yeah, but God gives it back even in great mercy. Do they lose it again? Yeah, but again... (laughs) But nevertheless, God is not slack concerning his promises. He purposed to save his people, and he does. And you too, O Christian, are his people. You are God's own. And he has said, I will deliver you. And because God cannot lie, he will, by faith in God the Son. And just as, and maybe this is a way of kind of pointing it forward too, God really delivered his people at the Exodus. God has truly delivered us in a far greater way through his son. And God will also come again to deliver us from this present evil age. And when he does that, he will keep all of his promises and bring us into that heavenly country, which knows no end. That is something also that we can look forward to as we go into remembering our Lord's passion. This has been a Word Fitly Spoken. If you like what you heard and want to know more, check us out, wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or twitter at wordfitly. I'm Willie Grills, here with Zell and Heidi. God love you, and God bless. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. 
but no man knoweth of his sepulchre until this day. And Moses was an hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land, and in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel.